So what I haven't done is to come here to tell everybody how to do transition. Uh, because uh, transition is a big experiment and really we started out with some simple idea, uh, some simple tools and some principles and, and an invitation for people to try this out wherever they are around the world. And uh, so I'm really fascinated to come here and to see what uh, transition looks like here and how you do it. Uh, and to take those lessons and those stories back to other places. Uh, so I'm very excited uh, to be here. Um, and I don't know how do I do the thingies. Is, oh, there's a thingy. Okay, fantastic. So I was asked really, I think, just to give a little bit of a grounding about transition. Although you probably all, you all know about transition, don't ask why you're here. But anyway, a little bit. And, uh, and then I'm talking again this evening. So what I'm going to talk about this time is to focus on, uh, I was asked to look at the relationship between transition and, and local government and how transitions and councils can work together. And then this evening I'll talk more about the new transition book and about how we now think about transition in that book. Uh, so I suppose just a little background really, I always really like this picture, I hope you can see it, these, these two men here, this is in uh, the uh, 1800s in America, and these gentlemen here are, are sitting on a big rock, uh, but what they're sitting on is a lump of pure copper, and at that stage, copper was found just lying around in old rivers as big lumps of copper. Kind of nice if you want copper. Nowadays, if you want copper, you have to dig something like this mine in, in Utah, which is three miles across and one mile deep. And, uh, and because the copper is at sort of 0.02% purity, so you, have to, you still want copper, but you have to work a lot harder to get copper. So in order to do so, you need lorries as big as that, you need to put a huge amount of energy in uh, in order to get copper back out again. And we live in a world of limits, and as we move through the resources that we have, there are still resources, but we have to put more and more energy and effort in to get those resources back out again. And the same goes with, with energy. So although there is, you know, we are now sometime around the peak in world oil production, and uh, one of the speakers this evening will, will, will talk more about peak oil, uh, but although there is a total amount of energy left, potential energy out there, actually uh, in the same way that in a game of football, I don't know if there is the same expression here where you talk about a game of two halves, where the first half was very different to the second half in a game of football. Uh, you can say the same thing about the oil age, in that the first half of the oil age was about cheap, easy to access oil. The second half is very, very different, uh, much harder to get, much more carbon involved in getting it out, and you have to use a lot more energy to get the energy back out again. So the, 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 the dark blue is the total uh, fossil fuels we still have in the world, but the grey is the amount of actually useful energy that we can get back, which, which falls away much, much faster. And after a certain point, it's just not worth the bother, really. Uh, and the different energy sources that, that, that we use have a different... Uh, you have to put more energy to get them out again. So in the 1930s in Saudi Arabia, you put one unit of energy in, you got 100 units of energy back out again, which is unprecedented, historically, absolutely amazing. And for us, it's, it's like, uh, it's, it's like uh, in, in the Transition Handbook I talked about, it's, it's like in the Asterix and Obelix books, where they have the magic potion, uh, which makes them incredibly strong. You know, we have a magic potion, uh, which is the fossil fuels, uh, and they have made us feel that we are superhuman uh, and incredibly powerful, and that we can do anything, but we are moving into a time where that, where that is no longer the case. I don't know if anybody saw this film on YouTube. I think everybody has, has seen this film on YouTube. Uh, and uh, it wasn't a joke. Lots of people thought that it was someone pretending. It was a real guy. Um, if you didn't see this, this was a man who, who was on the BBC News uh, in England, who was a financial trader, and uh, who, uh, who, who named the elephant in the corner. 
You know, and, and at the moment we have our, our, our politicians and bankers saying, yeah, well, it's bad, but it's not that bad. And it'll be all right again. Give us a couple of years and it'll all be okay again. This, this man came on, he said, not going to happen. And, uh, and, and, and it was very, if, if you haven't seen it, it's really worth seeing. It's a very, very powerful bit of television, actually, because it is really somebody naming uh, where we find ourselves. And uh, I, in, in England, I go and I give lots of talks to uh, councils and local government. And when I give talks, I always start by saying, uh, so I'm speaking for the next half an hour. For the next half an hour, we create a space in which the, 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 the term, when we get back to growth, when we get out of this, uh, we won't say that. Just for this half an hour, we create a space where we leave that outside. Uh, because actually, when you talk to most of those people on, on their own, they tell you that, and they can see that. But when they're all together, that's, uh, uh, they can't talk about that. So, uh, so again, so here we create a space where, 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 we can, where we can acknowledge that I think uh, we are on a really, really important tipping point. It's like when you go on a roller coaster, and you go up to the top, and just before you start to go down, it feels different. Your, your stomach surges a bit. and you, ooh. I don't mean you're sick. I mean you're just, there's a, there's a sense. And I think that's, that's where we find ourselves now, in that we are at the end of the age of cheap energy. We are, I think, at the end uh, of the age of economic growth, as we've known it. But every end is a new beginning. So rather than saying we're at the end of this, the end of that, and everyone feels terribly miserable, I think actually we can say we are at the beginning of lots of things, and we are at the beginning of something where actually uh, the work that you're doing in projects like Transition is about five years ahead of the thinking on what the story needs to be for the other half uh, than the people who seem to be in charge is. You know, I go to events, uh, some t I went to an event recently with uh, UK government officials, which was supposedly a kind of a secret summit about what a government response to peak oil would look like. And these were the kind of government brains who were thinking whose job it was to design a pathway through peak oil for the country. And they would, all they could think about was vehicle efficiency. More efficient cars, that's what we need to do, more efficient cars. And I would say, uh, food? <laughs> aye, 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 vehicle efficiency. So for the last five years, Transition has been saying these things, are, these things are really important. Peak oil, climate change, and increasingly uh, the economic situation and the whole debt uh, crisis that we face. And we've been quite out on the limb. It's been uh, uh, climate change would be more recognized. The other two issues wouldn't really be. And then a few months ago, the World Economic Forum, who advise all the world governments on what are the risks what are the key risks you need to be watching over the next 10 years? They published a report uh, and they assessed all the different risks by uh, um, uh, possible, likely financial impact and likelihood of occurring. And the three ones out of the front are peak oil and climate change, or they could call it energy price volatility, climate change and, uh, and economic crisis. So those are the three things that are out there. But actually when you look at them together, uh, the solutions uh, are, are, are different than if you just look at any of them on their own. So in, in 2005, we, we started this idea of transition. Uh, we didn't even call it that then. And then uh, since then, it, it's something which, is, which has uh, taken us all by surprise in terms of how it, how it had grown. When we started doing transition in Totnes, if I'd have thought that five years later I'd be standing uh, in a synagogue here uh, talking to you, I wouldn't have believed it at all. Uh, but what's powerful about it is that, uh, is that you do this. You know, we, we do, it's not like a Coca-Cola franchise that, that you buy and you have to do it, but as we say. It's, a, a, it, it's something where, where um, it's simple, it's easy to understand, uh, and it's an experiment that you're, you're part of. It's like open source. The model evolves as people do it, and we learn from everybody's experiences all around the world. So, uh, so by 2008, uh, when the first uh, transition handbook came out, there were 100 uh, transition projects 
starting to spread around the world. And now there are nearly 900, and uh, you can't even fit them on the map quite a lot of the time. And what's really interesting is, is that um, uh, people would say from quite early on, what does transition look like in the global south? Because we really designed transition as a kind of a detox for the, for the, for the global north, really. You know, if we, we have to reduce our consumption by 80% and the developing world to come up and meet us at a point that works, so that was how transition was really designed, as a way of coming down to meet that. And, uh, but then what we've seen recently is transition starting to emerge in Brazil, uh, where they're teaching transition to people in the favelas in Sao Paulo who, who can't read. Uh, and Brazil is just on fire with transition. It's just absolutely extraordinary. But that's, that's what we've tried to do is something that, uh, that just goes viral and people pick it up and take it. And every week there's a story that comes from somewhere that we have to sit down uh, because it's, it's uh, amazing what happens. So transition as we understand it, I think now, has different elements to it. So the first one is it's, it's an inner process as well as an outer process. You know, it's, it's an accepted idea that if something terrible happens, something traumatic, we give people counseling afterwards, post-traumatic counseling. But what does pre-transition counseling look like? How do we start now to try and build a kind of personal resilience uh, to change? Because change uh, can tend to happen very quickly. How do we support uh, the community to, to be more resilient in that way? Um, it leads by practical example. I was, when I arrived here today, went to look at one of the community gardens here in the town. Uh, uh, but these things are very, very powerful to, to just start, not wait for permission, but just to start doing things that are visible uh, and that people can see. It's a, it's a place, which is, it's a process which is rooted in place. So everywhere you go, it looks different. It's not like a toothpaste. Where, where every transition group is exactly the same, squeezed out of the same tube. Uh, every, even in London, where you have in one area of London, you have nine different transition initiatives. They're all very different, and they all do different things, and they work in different ways. And that's the, the richness of a bottom-up process that a government top-down process really can't manage to do. Uh, it's about turning problems into solutions. This is kind of an idea from, from permaculture, but... It's uh, uh, really about looking, in, and th this evening in, in the talk, I'll look at some places where, where people have been doing that really imaginatively. And when we started do, to do transition five years ago, I thought it was an environmental process. That was what I had in my head. But now, after five years, I think it's a cultural process. And it's about what does the culture of a place need to look like in order to be best prepared uh, for, for times of for times of change. And, and uh, part of that, and I really start to see that in, I mean, Totnes is the one that I know best because it's where I live, but you start to see how, how, how the culture starts to, to, to change. And it's also an economic process, I think, that we need to also um, start to see the process of transition as something that contains the seeds of the new economy of the place that we live. That the economy as we have it today is very oil dependent, is generally, uh, is, is often elements of it under the control of people who, who really don't care about this, about the place. Uh, and so reclaiming back the economy, starting new businesses, starting new livelihoods uh, is a key part of it. And it's about telling stories. And uh, uh, it's one of the things that I, that I see in, in quite a few transition projects, that, the, that it starts to change the story that the place tells about itself. Uh, and that's a really fascinating thing uh, to see. So I, I like that idea of, about stories, you know, that, that, and quite often when, when, when people will say, uh, but what will the future look like? You know, and, 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 and I always wonder what will the people uh, 100 years from now who look back to us at the people who need 87 million barrels of oil every day just to get out of bed and clean our teeth and go to work. Uh, uh, what will they look back at us and say? What stories will they tell about us who parted so hard uh, and didn't really leave them very much? And I think part of that we can get a sense by looking back at the stories maybe that people told before the age of cheap oil when the kind of uh, energy that we now just take for granted was completely unimaginable. You know, we had stories like... Uh, 
this is a, an, an old story. I don't know if you probably have a Dutch version of this about the giant who has these magic boots. And when you put the magic boots on with every stride, you can go about 30 kilometers with every stride. You know, so this is a, this, this small little man who steals one of his boots and goes off traveling. Well, you know, t of course, to be able to travel that far, that fast would have been unimaginable. Now we, we buy an airplane ticket. Or this is a, a, a story about a, a magic porridge pot where if, if you knew the magic word, you would say the, say the words to the pot and the pot would just keep on making porridge uh, until you told it to stop. Uh, unless you forgot the word to make it stop and you, your whole town filled up with porridge and made you very, very unpopular with your neighbors. Uh, but of course now uh, we have supermarkets which do much the same thing. And then this is the story about the elves and, and the shoemaker and the shoemaker who, uh, the people who would make shoes and uh, then they'd go, they'd, but they'd go to bed and then at night the elves would come and make all the shoes for them and they became very, very wealthy. In effect, you know, how, how we don't make anything anymore. Everything gets made in, in, in the Far East has become the sort of the manifestation of that story. But we don't really uh, appreciate that in, in our daily lives. So that's very, very light. But basically, it's just a, some of the things that, sort of are, that, that I think really distinguish the transition process as we see it around the place. Is it something that should feel joyful? It should be fun. It should be a, a, a pleasure to be involved with. Uh, it should be viral. There's something about it that spreads very quickly because anybody can do it anywhere. Uh, it's open source. So it's something that, that people can pick up and make their own. Uh, it's self-organizing. Uh, it's not centrally controlled and orchestrated. Uh, it's hopeful and it's constructive. Uh, it's iterative, so it learns from its mistakes and evolves in that way. Uh, it's clarifying and, it's, and it should also feel historic. I think, you know, if, we, if we're able to get this right, the agricultural revolution took thousands of years and the industrial revolution took hundreds of years. This needs to happen in about 10 or 20 years. And if we do it, if we're successful, it will be the thing, it will be something that our children and our grandchildren will tell stories about and sing great songs about and put a plaque up outside today, outside this hall to the fact that this event happened. And I think what you're doing, you should have that sense of history to it because this is such, that's such a, a, an extraordinary time in history uh, that what you're doing of actually looking at these challenges and responding uh, is really remarkable. So I just want to talk a little bit about, I was asked to say a, a, a bit about how transition groups in the UK are working with their local councils. Uh, so this is in, in London, uh, uh, where there are now about 40 different transition initiatives in London. So there isn't something called Transition London that is trying to change all of London with its millions and millions of people. Transition works on the neighborhood scale. It works on the scale that people feel familiar with and that they understand and that feels like home to them, that they recognize. Uh, so um, it's, it, uh, but on, on that scale, a lot of those groups then will be working with their, with their council. But when local governments get in touch with us and say, how do we make our place a transition? How do we make our town a transition town? We say, well, you can't. It, it's a process that you support, but you don't drive. It's a community process, but you support it. That, that's your role in this. So uh, some of the things, this is in, in Luton, which is a place north of London. And when we had our elections there uh, uh, last year, the, the transition group organized what's called a hustings, which is where all the different candidates come along and they sit down and, and people ask them questions. But it was framed that it was about resilience and it was about transition. And we want all the candidates who are running for, for government to come and to, and to talk about how their policy, how their work is going to make this place more resilient, is going to support this process of localization. And at the beginning of the event, somebody would uh, talk about the transition group, what they were doing. So it also meant that the candidates knew that and understood that. And lots of transition groups did that, and it's built very good relations with those people. This is in London, in uh, Kensal and Kilburn, which is uh, uh, two areas of London that have joined and made one transition group together. And uh, this is a garden that they've made on the underground station. Uh, and they have this fantastic sign which says, hello there, this is a community uh, uh, allotment. I can't actually do it, but... 
created by your lovely local transition town people <laughs> and the lovely people at London Underground. Come and join our group uh, and, and feel free to pick some of the produce. It's free, just leave enough for others. <laughs> Isn't that nice? And they entered something called London in Bloom, which was a competition about growing, about plants making places nicer. Uh, and I think they won. And uh, it's, it's fantastic. And, and that involved them working with the local council and so on. But that's, again, it's about the council supporting an initiative which has come from, from ordinary people choosing to do something exciting. This is one of my favorite uh, examples. You know, I think one of the things that we really need to understand is what it looks like when a very active community doing transition meets uh, a council committed to these ideas of resilience and low carbon and transition, what that relationship looks like when they meet each other. And the best example that we have so far comes from Montevello in Bologna, in Italy, where they started Transition Montevello and, it, and, it, and they showed films and talks and it was going very well. And then, about, and then they had elections coming up, and, and, and about 10 people in Transition Montevideo said, we'll run for the, for the comune, we'll run for the local government. And they ran a campaign around transition, and they used open space uh, to, to create a lot of their policies. Uh, and they all got in. <laughs> so now they have a very active transition group, and they have a council who are kind of transition people. And one of the first things that they did was they passed this amazing resolution, which you can read online, uh, which talked about resilience and making this a low-carbon town and putting solar panels and da -da. And it even talked about promoting values of simp simple living and frugality and uh, uh, is absolutely the most extraordinary thing. It was one of those things that in working at Transition Network that arrives in an email and you have to sit down for a little while, you know? Uh, yeah, so they're, they're a really good example of what councils could be like. This is in a place called High Wycombe, uh, and the man in the middle is from Transition High Wycombe, and the people either side uh, are from the local council. And uh, what they, they, they uh, developed together uh, an energy resource, for a, a kit that people could have at home to measure their energy and reduce their energy. But quite often councils want to engage with people and want to work with people to reduce their energy. But when it comes from the council, people often aren't really that interested. Whereas transition initiatives can engage people more, more richly from, from, from the ground. So again, the transition group does the work with, with the community and the council comes in and supports them uh, with some funding and with some materials and with, and with some resource. And that's been very successful as well. This is one of my favorite uh, stories. This is uh, in Tooting in London, which is one of the most diverse areas of London. Uh, very high levels of, of, of poverty in this part of London as well. And Transition Town Tooting came to us uh, uh, a while ago uh, at Transition Network and said, how do we do transition in Tooting? And we said, I, we have absolutely no idea. We don't live in Tooting. You live in Tooting. Figure it out. Well, I think we were a bit more helpful than that, but you know, that, was the, <laughs> that was the general idea. And uh, so one of the first things that they did was called the Trash Catchers Carnival. And they were the first transition group to, to be funded by the Arts Council. So this was kind of an art project and a community project. And the idea was they wanted to have a big street carnival uh, around the theme of ca taking care of, of the earth, looking after the earth, love for the planet. And uh, they worked with the local mosques and the local temples and the local schools, the local churches. They had about a thousand people involved, lots of young, lots of young people involved. They used a million old plastic bags. They used tons of willow. They made the most incredible, you can see, probably can't see because it's a bit light, but anyway, they made these like six meter high uh, moving uh, figures all made out of recycled uh, things. They had, in, in this picture here, this is uh, a part of their work around connecting young people and older people where these were um, 
like sitting rooms on wheels. So they were like a, an armchair with a lamp and a carpet and, and, and so some elders from the community would sit in the chairs and then the young people would pedal them uh, down the street. Uh, it was really lovely. So they had a thousand people involved in making, in making the carnival. They wanted to go down Tooting High Street and Transport for London, who's, who decide on that, said, you are not going to block off Tooting High Street. It's a main road through London, not going to happen. And so the only way you can do it then is to go to the council and announce that you're going to demonstrate. You're going to have a demonstration. You're going to protest. So the form said, what are you protesting about against? And they wrote, nothing. <laughs> so they said, OK. Uh, uh, and then the council didn't like it. And so the council said uh, that so they couldn't stop them from protesting because it's your right to do that. But they said, um, but if you do it, you have to pay the police bill, which is £50,000. So with one week to go before, the, con before the, the, uh, the, the carnival, the council said uh, it will cost you £50,000 or you can't do it. So they had all these children all with their costumes and their big things with the flapping arms and all the things. And they, had to, and they went to talk to the local police and the local police said, we'll pay the £50,000. <laughs> yeah. Because they had, a, they had a budget for working with the community. They said, this is the best working with the community we've ever seen here. So on the day, the sun shone. About 10,000 people came out to see it. Uh, they had the carnival at the end, they, they, it ended in a big park, and the local restaurants fed a thousand people for free. And then the next day they had a big um, reflection on the whole process, and people said, if we can do this, we can do anything. And I think if that's such a powerful uh, thing to create, and again, the, well actually here the council's role was to try and stop it, so maybe it wasn't a very good example of places working with their community. Uh, in Taunton, which is in the southwest of England, uh, the uh, uh, transition town Taunton had very good relations with their local council, and um, they uh, uh, and the council said, "We want you to come and do a, and do some visioning work with us, but not just with the, the the senior management, with everybody who works for the council. So from the chief officer down to the people who cut the grass, the people who make the tea." All 375 people, they came together and they did a whole big visioning exercise about what's this area going to look like uh, beyond peak oil and, and climate change. And uh, really extraordinary. And it's led to all kinds of things happening within the council. One of them was that uh, one of the senior planners and a guy who works cutting grass uh, met each other, never met before, and decided they were going to create a community orchard on some land owned by the council. Uh, and they also had a, ha had a day in the middle of the winter where they turned all the heating off in the offices uh, on a very cold day and uh, everybody had to wear a jumper to work and then they got prizes for who had the most horrible jumper. <laughs> this was, this was uh, one, of the, one of the things that, that's really lovely about transition is, is, is that uh, People, uh, people do very unexpected things, and people are very creative. And people say, oh, you are from Transition Network, you know how to do transition. But what's lovely is when you go to places and they're doing something completely that you never, ever would have thought of. And this sort of inventiveness is really lovely. So I went, there's a place called Malvern, which is in the sort of, um, middle of, of England, mid, Midwest. And uh, they had uh, what we call an unleashing. It was like their launch event. And they booked the biggest hall in the, in, in the town, it was with 500 people, big theater in the middle of Malvern. And with one week to go, they had sold 100 tickets, and they were really getting very, very sweaty. And, uh, and on the night, uh, it was completely full, and it was amazing celebration of Malvern, and they had choirs, and they had an orchestra, and they had speeches, and it was fantastic. But one thing that they did, they had... Uh, a, a, a time uh, in the middle, it was, wasn't very long, but onto the stage came 11 people and they were asked to each just talk for 40 seconds about what transition means to you and what you're doing to, to support it. But they were the head of the local police, 
the head of the local college, the local member of parliament, the head of the local council, the head of the local hospital. All those kind of key people in the town all came up on the stage and they all just talked about what transition meant to them, why they thought it was a great idea, what they were doing to support it. So you just got a sense of how deep it had gone in a very short period of time. It was quite extraordinary. What we're also seeing is, is places where councils uh, really get very proactive with this. So in the city of Bristol, in the southwest of England, uh, they, uh, supported by Transition Bristol, the, 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 the city council did a peak oil plan for the city. They're the first place to do that. Quite a lot of places in America have done that, but Bristol have done a peak oil plan for the, for the city. And then they did a, a local food plan that, that was one of the recommendations in that. So now underpinning all their policy uh, is peak oil and the need to respond to it. And one of the things that, that, that we, uh, an idea that we really like in transition is the idea of the, a keynote listener. I don't know if this, yeah, how well it translates, but quite often you have a keynote speaker at a conference, but we don't really like keynote speakers. Uh, so you have a keynote listener instead. So you invite people uh, who are politicians. We say, we don't want you to come and give a speech. This isn't an opportunity for you to give a speech. This is an opportunity for you to come and listen. <laughs> and it's an opportunity for you to just come and experience the buzz that you get in, in transition events. So this is uh, Ed Miliband who was then the climate change minister, who's now leads the Labour Party in England. He was invited to the Transition Network conference as a keynote listener. And he said he wanted to come and give a speech, and we said, well, you can come, but you can only come as a keynote listener. <laughs> and he had a great time. And he talked about it for months afterwards. I was a keynote listener at the Trans <laughs> Transition Network conference. Uh, this is in Nottingham, uh, the city of Nottingham. They, the, again, the, 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 the transition group worked with them, and they passed a peak oil resolution, uh, uh, which was unanimously approved. And now all of their policy that they make is based on an understanding of peak oil. And they work very closely with, with the transition group. So transition groups can have a really good role in terms of, uh, in terms of supporting uh, councils through that process as well. And this is a pro, uh, one of my favorite projects that we've done in, in Totnes, which is called Transition Streets, which is the idea of rather than the government saying we want people to reduce their energy use, so we'll give you some leaflets and we'll give you a grant to put solar panels on the roof, where there's always the danger that you put the solar panels on the roof, you get the money in, and you just spend the money you've saved on, an, on a holiday, which rather defeats the whole point in terms of carbon. Uh, this works on a street-by-street -street level. So you, you get a group of people together on your street, you meet seven times in each other's houses. First week you look at water, energy, and so on. In Totnes, 500 households have done this now. And on average, they save one and a half tons of carbon. They save themselves 700 pounds a year. But when you meet them in the street, all they talk about is the people they know now that they didn't know before. The council's role with this was to give us some funding to allow us to give people grants. Uh, they gave us support in those kind of a way, but it was a process that the, the that the transition group led with the council's support. It was very exciting. Yesterday night uh, in Brixton in London was the launch uh, of the Brixton Pound, which is a local currency scheme there, but going electric. So it's a mobile phone-based currency as well as a printed currency. It's really exciting. It's kind of the next evolution of transition currencies. I'll talk a bit more about that tonight, but that has, been, that has a lot of support uh, from the local council I'm going to. Go through. No, actually, I will say that. Um, so, that so, so the local council in Brixton have said, we want this to become the currency of choice for Brixton, and, we, and you can pay your council tax uh, in that. You can pay your rates. And so now also in Bristol, they're launching the Bristol Pound, which is the same model in a city of a million people, and, you'll be able to, and that's with uh, Transition Bristol and the city council, which is very exciting. So this is a quote, which, again, I probably can't see, actually, because it's quite... But I'll try. This is uh, just uh, something that captures, I think, uh, how transition is working with local politics. And then I'll, I'll leave you with this. This is, was in the Guardian newspaper a little while ago. It says, uh, if you want to catch a glimpse of the kinds of places outside the political mainstream where the new politics might be incubated, take a look at the transition movement. It isn't so hard to see why politicians are interested. The transition movement is engaging people in a way that conventional politics is failing to do. It generates emotions that have not been seen in political life for a long time. Enthusiasm, idealism, uh, and the passionate commitment. 
So uh, um, this evening, in, in, in the talk this evening, I'll, I'll talk a lot more about transition and, and, and what we're doing, but um, hopefully that's given a little sense of that uh, aspect of transition. And uh, if you want to find out more about transition, there's some information there. So thank you very much for your attention.